The domain driven design gives a language, a ready to use language, to focus on the difference between cost and value. Cost, the solution, value, the problem. Customers want value. So the customer wants a problem to be solved. He or she doesn't want a solution. To be effective under pressure in this situation, you need to have interiorized a uh, language that makes you able to speak between technical and business people. And the domain-driven design provides it. Welcome to the API The Docs podcast. My name is Laura Wash, and I am the host to this episode. And today I have a guest who, similarly to our last guest, also wrote a love letter, well, an ode to writing and technical writing at that and wrote about the powers that writers hold in creating the narratives and stories and how much these stories hold our attention and how much power it holds and the importance of language building language as a tool for that. So I think a lot of you are going to know our guest today. Let me welcome Luca Vettor to the podcast. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be there. Me too. So I'm assuming that a lot of our listeners know you because of the blog that you write on Medium. And I really love your articles. I wish Medium didn't have the restriction of how many I can read in a month. And in January, if I'm not mistaken, you were writing one that specifically was very, very much to the topic of API documentation, technical writers, and it was about domain-driven design. And why are you think that that is the language that might solve all problems for technical writers, and they should definitely pay attention and pick it up and learn it and use it. But before we go into that, and since then you have, and before that also, you have written a lot. In that one, you're talking about yourself as a technical writer, but since then, um, I see that you more identify as an information architect. And actually on that Medium blog on your self-introduction, you are writing about a, yeah, a riveting way how you arrived to calling yourself a writer and a technical writer. So I would like to ask you first about that because you have such an interesting career path. It's a pleasure to, to speak about that. Uh, yes, because my, my career started in uh, 2000. And uh, probably you remember, it was the age of the dot-com companies. And you certainly remember how things run. I was, at the time, a recent graduate in physics and got into the econophysics business. I intuited that it was an unstable business and shifted my attention to the software development. It was love at first sight, definitely. I spent around 10 years developing software, first in finance and then in the sport industry, where I still am. It was the realm of the problem solving, as I wrote in Medium, and I love solve problems. However, over time, I realized that uh, uh, I love avoiding problems more. So I became interested in uh, project management because my experience told me that uh, uh, that was the area of work in to prevent recurring problems. That was my, my intention. But after interpreting various project management roles and even approaches over about eight years, I realized that uh, uh, there were recurring problems in this area as well and not due to the specific business or technology. So I turned my attention uh, and studies to the earth of what I became convinced was the context in which many problems uh, arise, and that's communication. And that led me to the domain-driven design, because uh, as a technical writer, I am uh, in the middle between technical people and business people. They often struggle to understand each other. And that's the root cause, at least in my experience, in my 20 years experience, that's the root cause of all the problems. It's also the source of what I used to call, but it's not only me that calls it uh, in this way, induced complexity. Mm -hmm. You probably heard people listen to people saying how complex this is. It's not possible to explain in a simple way. This is a psychological defense when you are not able to fully understand, to deeply understand the topic. And in many cases, this is a language problem because you don't have words to express that problem. When I discovered the domain-driven design, I've discovered an already solved problem because it's all there, the formulation of the problem and also the solution. And when you approach domain-driven design, it sounds common sense. Mm -hmm because it's obvious. 
problem and solution are different things. They have different dynamics. But uh, surprise, surprise, I wrote uh, uh, an article on Medium titled The Difference Between Problem and Solutions. Mm -hmm. I had more than 2,000 views. It got uh, distributed by Medium. I was surprised about the interest of people about uh, a statement that is obvious, problem and solution mm -hmm. are different. What is not clear to many people is that uh, any kind of solution, even the best one in the world, is a cost. And as a cost, it must be reduced. The problem brings value on the table. And that's the main difference that, uh, surprisingly, many people, even high-level managers, don't uh, get. Because... Common sense would say it's the other way around, but it's not. Or at least that's how we learn, right? That the question is given and the answer is what the value lies in, but what you're saying is the opposite. Exactly. It's like uh, agile methodologies that are very popular in, in uh, the software industry, Scrum, uh, Kanban, and so on. Methodologies to organize projects. If you look at uh, the principles of such as methodologies, it's nothing more than common sense. Like uh, you have to know your customer to deliver him or her value. You have to get feedback from your customer to be sure to deliver value to the customer. If you listen to, to these sentences, they are obvious, but at the same time, they are the most difficult to put in practice. Yes. And the domain-driven design gives a language, a ready-to-use language, to focus on the difference between cost and value. Cost, the solution, value, the problem. Mm -hmm. Customers want value. So what the customer wants a problem to be solved. He or she doesn't want a solution. It seems that I'm playing with words. No, you're not. Yeah, I fully agree with you. When you plan a project and you focus on solution, you mainly waste the most part of your time and your resources. And that's why I'm writing about uh, domain-driven design first uh, to learn, because uh, when I learn a new topic, uh, it's extremely useful and helpful to write about it. Second, because uh, the Medium community is fantastic, fantastic because uh, you can uh, get in touch uh, with people that agree and people that disagree. Mm -hmm. In both cases, feedback are extremely useful as a learning uh, tool, because uh, when I get confirmation, I know I'm learning properly. I'm learning right. When I get objections, I try to answer. And from the discussion, I learn something more. And what I'm learning is that what often I consider obvious, like the difference between solution and problem, is not. And the main objection I received is that in an ideal world, problem and solution are fully distinguishable when you work with high-level people. But when you work with normal people, that's not true. Why? Because of the pressure. Under pressure, when you have uh, a strict deadline, uh, when you have to, to deliver something for uh, yesterday, it's psychologically too hard to sit down and analyze the problem. You want the solution because uh, this is what you're going to deliver to your client. That's a mistake, but psychologically, you are in Russia. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But even in the ER, they do triage first. Yeah, but it's life. In the end, I, I think we are so used to interact with machines that at a, at a certain point, we think we behave like machines, but we are not. We are still human, even if we are in front of a smartphone 24 hours a day, and we are not software that can execute uh, comments uh, at the maximum possible speed of the hardware uh, when it ran. We are human, so when we are in rush, even the most obvious uh, distinctions fall apart. So we focus on the solution and we forget the problem. And it's possible that when you arrive to your client and you deliver your solution, the client says, that's good, but that's not what I want. That's not what I need because I need to solve my problem, you didn't solve it. You forget the problem while you were trying to solve it. And this, again, is psychologically comprehensible. Uh, I think that any developer, after some years of experience, well knows that uh, technology has uh, its own dynamics, even mm -hmm. psychological dynamics. So when you start developing software, you are in front of software 
as if you were in front of another people with their needs. So your attention becomes tunnel focused on the needs of the software mm -hmm. that has been built in abstract, not for your specific business. If you are in the sport business, for example, you use a stack, an enormous stack of technologies that were not thought to solve the sport business, but just to solve logical problems. Mm -hmm. You have to put all that together to solve problems of your client that are specific. In this uh, moving from abstraction of the technology to the concrete uh, of the specific need of your client, it's so easy, surprisingly, to forget that uh, the problem brings, brings the value because all your effort is in understanding the solution. Let me backpedal a little bit from domain-driven design itself to, you mentioned uh, induced complexity and uh, you also mentioned that uh, domain-driven design as a methodology uh, finds agreement, but also disagreement because at first it seems that it can only be properly in its full spirit applied in an ideal situation because problem and solutions may overlap in, in an emergency situation or under pressure, which I don't fully disagree with, but... There's this other problem, complexity, which exists. And events are not always linearly following each other. They influence each other. Uh, the solution influences the problem. The problem influences the next problem. You write about your view on having intrinsic complexity and induced complexity. And you did talk about induced complexity. But what about the intrinsic complexity and the promise of domain-driven design. The crucial point about uh, the um, interesting complexity is to define it. I think that uh, the Kinefin framework allows uh, uh, to, to have the best uh, uh, definition in the world because it says when the relationship between cause and effect are not known, in that case, your system is complex. So enter a human anywhere, you have a complex system. So you have an example that doesn't have humans, so it's not a humans that induce complexity? You mentioned the weather. But also the market. Uh -huh. The market sometimes behaves like the weather because when you conceive a product, you build it, you deliver it to the market, you have uh, no certainties about the response of your customers. When uh, Steve Jobs presented the iPhone, he had no certainties about the success of the iPhone in the, in the future. He had a vision, but without, without any kind of certainties. That's complexity. Cause I put a product on the market. Effect, customers will love it. The connection between the two is not at all uh, predetermined. predetermined. Mm -hmm. that's, complex. that's the intrinsic complexity. Something you cannot in any way know beforehand. That the distinction between complexity and complication. Something complicated just need an expert to be solved because it's just difficult, but knowledge is there. You just have to understand how it works. Driving an um, airplane, airplane is complicated, not complex, because if you put in place uh, best practices, all instruction you have to put in place, the airplane in most of the cases, will do what you want. There are accidents, for sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> but these are exceptions. It's deterministic. You steer and the airplane behaves like you want if there are no uh, incident and so on. That's uh, what is called complicated. If you have to, to drive a, an airplane, you need a pilot because the pilot has, be, has been trained to do this complicated stuff. That's not complex. My personal experience only is that we are addicted to complicated, to the point that we deny complexity even when it's staring at us. I mean, global warming is the best example of that. Part of this is that we simply don't have the language or the mental models to deal with it. And part of it is, is this, this pervasive thing that the more I look at real complex problems, it's, it becomes this mesmerizing abyss. That's just, it's lovely to look at, but which thread do you even pull? And you were talking about products put to market and a complex uh, environment. Now, technical writers, information architects, technologists 
operate in this space together with other people and all of our shortcomings and strengths. How did you find your peace with this once you, I do assume that you had your own internal fight with recognizing complexity and understanding the, the devilish natures of it? It helps, again, the domain-driven design approach, because uh, when we face a problem, we need a model to think about the problem. And uh, it's extremely important, the awareness that every model is wrong, because it's just a facet of the reality. So based on the model uh, you use to face a problem, even the intrinsic complexity changes, because uh, as much as the, the model allows simplify the way you formulated the problem, and here we are up to the, langu to the language, as much you can simplify the problem itself. This is why it's about language. The language you use to define a problem is the model that you will use to face the problem itself. If your formulation of the problem is a mess, you probably fail because the model you selected is wrong. It's not wrong, it's not the proper one, for the goal you have. And again, this is, it seems a complicated statement about something obvious that is before starting uh, to reach a goal, define the goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, see, you see how obvious it is, but if you neglect this aspect, the induced complexity increases. And in the real life, it's often extremely difficult to distinguish between intrinsic and induced complexity, especially when you are under pressure. So what you were saying about in real life, intrinsic and induced complexity, often impossible to, to fully separate or to even distinguish, I recognize that from mediation training, communication training, mediation training that I had, how surprisingly hard it is, even in a dry swimming exercise, to create the same mental model between two conflicting parties, that two conflicting parties, or two parties, not even a conflict, two parties would share the same mental model and describe the problem in between them that separates them, to describe that using the same words, emphasizing the same things. And so when uh, this becomes an even more fine-tuned, lots of factors uh, issue with high uh, technical knowledge required to, to even enter the conversation. It's a frustrating experience. I see the role of technical writers, uh, even writers, information architects, project managers, similar to that of the mediator, the translator or in interpreter. If you um, suggest that uh, using the methodology and the, the system of domain-driven design would help us in this mediation, how does one approach this? Does this require an academic approach, a method that you learn and then you try using little by little? Or is there an iterative approach to bringing this into your everyday professional practices? It's iterative, even surprisingly, because often this kind of methodology works if adopted 100%. In that case, in the case of the domain-driven design, this is not uh, necessary. You don't have to embrace it uh, in the full uh, um, package mm -hmm. of it, because uh, it starts from the core that says that uh, software engineers are not the only people involved in building software. And that's again a little bit obvious, but uh, is the pivotal point of the miscommunication between technical people and business people, because uh, very often the process is supposed to be business people say what are the requirements. A business analyst try to digest them and translate in some language comprehensible for technical people, and then software engineers implement. Mm -hmm. This linearity is a problem because uh, when you build software, you discover its behavior, its behavior while developing. And to be sure that this discovery is uh, coherent uh, with the business goals, you need to have uh, next to you business people to confirm that the evolution you are experiencing of uh, your software is okay. So the role of mediators that uh, you are mentioning of uh, technical writers, uh, information architects, project managers, and so on, is uh, a sort of uh, 
not only mediators, but, but only the glue between mm-hmm. uh, two kinds of people that often are not able to speak each other. So yes, uh, in terms of language, translators, but in terms of uh, actors of the organization of the project, mm-hmm. their role is to force people to stay together in a room and uh, describe what should happen when the software runs in front of the client. A technique to facilitate that, for example, that is coherent with the domain-driven design is the event storming, where you put together different uh, professionals, mainly a tester, a business person, and uh, a software engineer. And uh, without speaking at all uh, about technology, on a board, they try to describe what exactly what should happen, which are the actors uh, using the software, and based on their actions, what should happen. This is a way uh, to build a model that is not far away from the business needs because you start modeling uh, from what your users do. It may sound strange that uh, something like uh, even storming needed to be invented to put together different skills in the same room. But that, again, is the core of the domain-driven design, and it's the core of the problems in communication in the software projects, that uh, uh, different skills too often love to work uh, separate Mm -hmm. and uh, have boundaries between people instead of designing logical boundaries of the software. And that's the point. Translate, sure, but uh, technical writer, exactly as the project manager, project manager is not always there where people involved in a software project speak. Precisely. So they have to provide a way, a language, a common language to facilitate them. Mm-hmm. And one, what I'm trying also in my job to do is to propose little pieces of domain-driven de- design in the moment when projects are in troubles because of uh, misunderstandings. Mm-hmm. And Every time I try this approach, what I find is that the business standpoint and the technical standpoint diverge because they didn't have a common language to stay together. Mm -hmm. What do you do then? First, by visualizing what is the cause of the troubles. And that's another uh, important learning of the domain-driven design. Visualize. Before creating a language built up uh, of uh, words you need a language that can be put uh, in a board and be under the eyes of all people the power of diagrams is sometimes surprising because uh, when uh, you diagram you abstract uh, your language you, you abstract the way you represent the model because the model is becomes just uh, square lines and a few words that connects uh, what you are visualizing. So the first approach is let's visualize. We are not understanding each other. Let's try to simplify what we are not understanding. And then you transform your visualization in events, something that is supposed to happen to happen in the software. And then who is responsible? Who in terms of the system software is responsible for this happening? The user click a button on the front end. This starts a process. Behind the scene, what is the software uh, process that is, that is responsible to take charge of the press button in the front end? You can see when uh, while I'm speaking that uh, I always end up with something obvious because what I'm saying, someone push a button, there must be something responsible to execute the command related to that button. You can be surprised, but this simple link between the customer action and the engine behind the scene that execute that command often is the, the place of misunderstanding because the business value of pressing that button completely disappear when a software developer is uh, building the engine that execute commands and has a huge amount of other problems to make it working. That's when the business people should be there and help the software engineer to stay focused on the business. Mm-hmm. It's not, uh, no one is guilty of nothing. It's a, it's a matter of stay focused on the business, even when the technical problems are overwhelming. And 
uh, are in contrast with your deadlines, are in contrast uh, in conflict with uh, uh, the commitment you had. Again, to uh, to be effective under pressure in this situation, you need to have interiorized uh, language that makes you able to speak between technical and business people. Mm -hmm. And the domain-driven design provide it. DDD has a very specific uh, expression they use for that language that you very carefully avoided, but let's bring that in. Uh, so DDD talks about the ubiquitous language that is basically a shared mental map, in my understanding, put into words, into a vocabulary that sort of holds the threads of every stakeholder. The way I imagine this is that even if all the stakeholders are looking at the same space, the mental model they have is a projective based on their perspective. And even though they are looking at the same thing, they are going to draw a different thing. And when you ask them to draw their projection, you need several of them together. And somebody who comes in with this sort of neutrality of, all right, folks, but you are, do you realize that you're looking at the same space? You're operating in the same space. You're looking at the same space. You're just standing at different points of the same space. So let's agree on which projections are we going to use to talk about this or this or this. So when that comes up, what projections we talk about. This is how I imagine this in, in very layman words. And that's exactly what, what it is. Because imagine you have the model of your problem to solve. The first thing you have to do to model is to uh, design boundaries between the different contexts of your problem. It's exactly the same as uh, um, designing a, a map. Mm -hmm. You trace the boundaries uh, between countries, and in each country, there is a language. To indicate uh, something in uh, France, the word is different uh, compared to the US uh, word, but it can be the same. That's the ubiquitous language ubiquitous inside defined boundaries. Mm -hmm. A boundary is a subsection of the business. So the stakeholders that are interested in the subdomains of the business that uh, what is called the bounded context face should understand this language. And within these boundaries, there is no ambiguity of the about the words of the ubiquitous language. The next step is that uh, the software must speak the same ubiquitous language of the boundary context in which uh, it is developed. That means uh, that when a developer explains a problem to a stakeholder, the words the software developer uses to explain the problem to the stakeholder must be comprehensible for the stakeholder because the software has been built and designed using exactly the language of the stakeholder. So very practically, this boils down to, for example, the API endpoints being named with the words that you already agreed on. And API in particular are absolutely crucial because they have the interface uh, toward the business. So to, to, to explain uh, how, how should be a process in which APIs uh, take a part, you need to have a language that uh, the API users, uh, but not only the API users, also the end users uh, mm -hmm. of the API uh, must understand. For sure, this is not possible. Uh, it's not possible to have the same language in each part of the software when the software is, for example, uh, a huge uh, CMS, for example, or uh, something like um, administrative uh, software that, cover, that covers many areas of the business. But each area has its own language, and this language should be uh, the same used to formalize the software itself so that uh, the model of the software mirrors the model of the business that's a way to reduce the induced complexity because uh, your effort is in maintaining coherent the language that describes two facets of the situation, the technical facet and the business facet. Mm -hmm. If a technical writer would feel the drive to get into this and, and represent this understanding in a meeting where they are while well, defining the problem space, how does this not become the most ungrateful hat to be worn in the room? Uh, you need uh, to, to sell your position and you can do that uh, by, uh, by focusing 
on the venue that all that people must uh, bring to the customer. It's easy to forget it, uh, but uh, it's the North Star. If uh, remember people that uh, they are there to solve a problem, not just to invent solutions, mm -hmm. is a problem. It's because the focus on the customer has been lost. Mm -hmm. But uh, we work for our customers. So usually this simple sentence is enough uh, to be not uh, hated. <laughs> Because uh, you point out that uh, uh, sometimes the problem has been uh, forgotten mm -hmm. because of uh, the attention, the unique attention to the solution. Mm -hmm. That's a way. The approach is always the same. Keep it simple. When something is uh, struggling, it's because uh, the language we are using to express it is not enough expressive to allow all the people around the table to understand it. And so you have to simplify it. But the, the maximum simplification is uh, we need to deliver value. Mm -hmm. If uh, we are speaking about something that is not connected with uh, that need, we are doing something wrong. So we have to sit down and reflect to the fact that we are no, no longer serving our customer, but uh, we are speaking about philosophy. That usually it's enough. Mm -hmm. What is your latest challenge in the field? or in even in practicing domain-driven design methods? Convince people that uh, be precise with words uh, is mandatory, that mm -hmm. you cannot uh, uh, call something in a way and in another way in the same situation. If uh, something is called A, it's A, not A, and sometimes B, and sometimes C, and sometimes D, because all we know that uh, we are indicating the same thing. That's, uh, uh, it seems uh, a little, um, it may seem a detail, but uh, if you think that uh, you speak uh, a lot during the day and uh, the efficiency in communication is about, in technical communication, for sure, not in general, but for in the technical communication is about the precision of the words you use. It's crucial to be precise, but uh, often Again, because uh, because of the pressure, because of the rush, because of uh, culture, uh, people don't, don't like to be precise. It seems uh, something that conflicts with the, the urgency of the problem to be precise. But if you remove precision from uh, domain-driven design, again, you have a mess because uh, uh, the core is the to be rigorous in in, in language, and that's the, the if. Uh, I had to list uh, the, um, the most impacting difficulties in adopting this uh, mindset because in the end, is before everything is a mindset, then it's a technique, is uh, convince people to be precise in language. Yes. And it's difficult. I, I, I fully understand because my, my job is to take care of communication. So for me, it's a priority. priority. I fully understand that if you have another role, this is not your priority to be precise when you speak because you want you want to get to the to the result mm. and that's why we have to work together it's not about something someone that works better than another it's about being focused on the most impacting problem in that moment and often the most impacting problem surprisingly is communication not even the problems that come from the business mm -hmm. And you solve this by sort of mirroring and going back to the language that you already agreed on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. By mm -hmm. glossaries, diagrams, and a loop in that. Mm -hmm. Meaning, uh, I diagram as much uh, as I can. I double check uh, with all the standpoints uh, that the, the diagram uh, involves. Starting from the diagram, then I write down the glossary of the terms that are visualized. In this way, I move from the visualization to the formalization of the problem. Mm -hmm. But the first step is always visualizing. I really like the way you were talking about precision. My take on that is that precision is a high art form of courtesy towards others. And if we don't practice that, then we need to know that somebody else will have to pay the adjustment price. Very true. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And, uh, uh, but uh, practicing uh, precision is an investment because uh, at least at the beginning, 
it uh, slows you down yes. to be precise. And that's often not acceptable because of business uh, reasons. You have to be fast, so you approximate. And the first approximation that you feel to be acceptable is language. In the end, you don't de deliver language, you deliver software. It's a mistake, I, I, I know, but uh, if you are in rush, you don't care about language. You care about uh, what uh, your customer uh, will pay, that is software, the service. It's comprehensible, but uh, in the long play, it's a failure because uh, uh, this um, uh, lose in language precision leads uh, to speak always and always about the solution. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the solution is what you deliver. You, you cannot uh, lose focus on the solution because your clients want a solution or better, your client will pay you the solution, the software you, you sell is, is a solution, but the solution, that solution has no value if uh, it doesn't solve a valuable problem. Let me double back just to be sure. So one of the, hmm, say selling points of using uh, the DDD methodology would be that the customer is in a complex environment. Their problems are intertwined, but with DDD, we may be able to clearly define a problem space, which we can map and then deliver a clearly defined solution that maps to that problem. And therefore we can claim that we are solving the problem. Exactly. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And then we can move on to the next problem. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's the point, because when you buy something, what you have in your hands is a solution. The solution may be a smartphone, a TV, a Netflix service, all that are the solutions. And so it's uh, comprehensible that uh, it, it's easy to focus on the solution because it's what you pay, it's what you deliver, but it's not the why you pay, it's not the why you deliver. You deliver the smartphone because the value is in communication. So if the smartphone doesn't solve the problem of communication, it's useless. Mm -hmm. In the same way, if a service like Netflix uh, is not enough uh, a pleasure because its aim is to entertain people, it could be the best software in the world, but it would not, it wouldn't solve the problem that is to be entertained. Right. And that's easy with the intuitive services like smartphone at Netflix. In the B2B business uh, is less obvious, but the mechanism is the same. You sell a solution for a problem. The solution mm -hmm. is the cost. This is why you pay the solution because it's a cost. The mm -hmm. value is the problem. With Years ago, conversations as Denek Nemec, who is behind uh, the Superface project, he has been advocating for many, many years uh, for a shared domain language as being the prerequisite for autonomous APIs. Well, the field is very loud also about AI and very, very quickly getting adopted. Can you underline this, that having a clearly defined taxonomy, a domain language, is the only maintainable way to involve AI in this? Not sure that is mm -hmm. the only, but uh, it's uh, a crucial enabler. Mm -hmm. Without that, uh, you lose control because uh, in the end, uh, you have to take decisions, building software of any kind. Taking decisions means uh, thinking. Thinking mean, means uh, to put in place a language. If that language is not formalized enough, you lose control of the language, so you lose control of your thinking, so you lose control of your decisions. It's a chain. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure controlling the language is enough. So it's the only silver bullet, but uh, I'm sure that without it, uh, sooner than later, you lose control. Mm -hmm. What is the next big blob of learning that you're planning to do? Work in progress. <laughs> and, uh, for now, I I've just started with uh, domain-driven design. Uh, I'm um, watching all the videos about uh, Europe uh, domain-driven design. From last year. They recently published it from last year. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, a sea of knowledge that I have to absorb. So I think that at least for uh, one year, uh, I will learn uh, domain-driven design and put in place uh, in, in my job. Because, mm -hmm. because uh, I feel uh, there is the, that uh, it's uh, much more than uh, a prescriptive method. 
method. It's, uh, as I said before, it's a mindset uh, that yes. I want to absorb to be able to then go beyond it. But uh, I'm not yet uh, at this level of um, going beyond. I, I need to stay with the domain-driven design uh, for some months uh, still. Mm -hmm. The next conference is going to be June, I think 8, 9 is the actual conference track of domain-driven design. It's going to be in Amsterdam. And for that specific reason, actually, we have uh, organized API the Docs Europe, which is now in person. We organized it to be on the 6th, 7th, because we also believe that people who are interested in domain-driven design can possibly maybe tangentially, maybe directly benefit from hearing what is said at uh, the API the Docs conference and vice versa. And it's pretty hard to travel recently. So that's why we put them into the same city. So, um, well, I hope that that will be to the benefit of everybody. What is the um, message in a nutshell that you would like to leave our listeners with? I invite uh, to have respect of words because we are so used to word to language that uh, it's easy to lose uh, the feeling of them. And the fact that uh, a wrong word in an exact moment can lead to a failure. I want to, to invite uh, people to, to be aware of uh, is that uh, a word matter is not just, just a sound that is a, tran a transient sound that now I say and uh, in a moment will disappear. It's a concept that can become software, that can become business. So that's the message. Words matter. They are not just uh, a way of communicating. They bring with them part of the value of the software industry. In your blog, you use the expression, words themselves are models, right? Yeah. Luca, thank you very, very much. I have to re-listen again and again <laughs> to also take all this knowledge. Thank you very much for also underlining uh, what people probably believed already and for taking them even further on this journey and introducing some new concepts and solutions here. I hope to see you again soon at uh, one of the conferences or in this uh, podcast, uh, let's see, um, like a year later. It's always interesting to hear how people change their directions or their ideas or how they even go deeper into some topics. So thank you again. It was a pleasure and an honor. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks to you. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this, and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.